Hello, I'm KMO. I do the Sea Realm podcast. Some of you have heard it, some of you have appeared on it. I'm hoping others of you who have neither heard nor appeared on it will be doing one or the other very soon. Uh, I've been doing the podcast for about five years. And what I want to do first off is dispel any curiosity you might have. Yes, this is in fact a hand grenade on my shirt and it has this camouflage pattern, and you're welcome to ask me about that in the Q&A, but I don't have time to talk about it now. Uh, what I do have time to do is steal a joke from Mike Daisy. Mike Daisy is a monologuist. He did, he's still doing a monologue called The Agony and the Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, which Olga and I saw in Manhattan a few weeks ago. And he started off, he, he's a big fan of Apple technology, a devotee of Steve Jobs, but also he's coming around to some very profound criticisms, moral criticisms of Apple Computer and Steve Jobs. But, he doesn't much care for Microsoft. So of PowerPoint, he says that PowerPoint is a very Microsoft idea. PowerPoint is the idea that there is a technology that can allow people who are in the same room with one another to communicate with one another. <laughs> I've never learned to use PowerPoint, but this is my sort of compromise position. It's a single slide. It is the only image that I'll be using. And so uh, for those of you who are not actually in the room, right now, but are listening in the future, audio only. What I have on the screen behind me is an image of Guan Yin, who is a bodhisattva. And this is a statue that has been at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, Missouri for many decades. And the Nelson and the adjacent Kansas City Art Institute, which is where the famous painter Thomas Hart Benton taught, was a playground of mine, because I grew up mostly in Kansas City, Missouri. From the time I was in the fourth grade, all the way through till the time I got my associate's degree at Penn Valley Community College, I lived in Kansas City, Missouri. And for the last few years in that span, I was doing a lot of LSD. And I would go to the Nelson and to the adjacent Kansas City Art Institute where I had taken courses as a uh, high school student and I felt very at home there. I felt you know, privileged, I felt as though I was a member of the club and I could just go and play there and be at my ease, so I did. And my friends and I, we would, as I say, take large doses of LSD, probably too large for cavorting in public, but it didn't stop us. And we would go through the Nelson. And you can spend, it's, it's not the Met, you know, it's not the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, but it's a big museum filled with really excellent pieces of art. And we would just wander and take it in, just let it wash over us. And our path through the museum, I don't know if it was chaotic or planned, but I did know that there was an attractor somewhere in the middle of my journey and this was it, this bodhisattva Guan Yin. So I don't remember how much I knew about Buddhism when I first encountered this. You know, it's very easy to project our current knowledge and our current sophistication back into some previous stage in our lives. And I, I don't think I knew much about Buddhism when I first encountered this, but I do remember on multiple occasions standing in front of it. I won't say I had any sort of revelation that I could articulate, but it was a powerful experience, so powerful that this image has stuck with me, even though I haven't been to Kansas City for many years. But last week, when I was at the ASPO conference, there was a session in the morning with John Michael Greer, um, Sharon Astick, and Dmitry Orlov. And John Michael Greer made mention of his opinion that a lot of people focus on saving the world. They focus on the big picture in order to avoid doing the necessary work in their own lives that they really need to do. And I remember nodding in agreement, but I also remember that this image, along with two quotes, immediately jumped to mind. The first quote is from Joseph Campbell, and Joseph Campbell said that when we stop obsessing about ourselves and our own self-preservation, we undergo a truly heroic transformation of consciousness. Who resonates with that? I really do, I really do. But at the same time, another quote came to mind, and this is maybe a bit self-aggrandizing because it's a quote from somebody who has been a, on my podcast many times. He's a friend of mine. We've done a speaking tour together. And one time when he was on my podcast, he said something like the following. What I'm suggesting is that people who don't take any interest, people who don't want to be woken up, people who don't want to know about depletion of resources, leave them to it. Just leave them. The most considerate and devoted and compassionate thing you can do on this sacred path is to enlighten and empower yourself. 
it sort of seems to be at odds with what Joseph Campbell was saying. Does anybody resonate with that second one? Okay, fewer. Uh, I tend to talk long, so I found that a good thing to do is just to give you the conclusion up front. I, I agree with both of them, but I am more attracted to what Neil had to say. I think that focusing on oneself is the same thing, really, as focusing on your larger community if you keep in mind that the distinction between yourself and that community is a delusion. These are really complementary statements. That's my conclusion. Now I'll work around to it. So, the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is a being who feels the compassion, feels the pain of the world, understands the suffering of people who do suffer. So Guan Yin is a shortened version of a longer Chinese word that I don't remember, but it translates, according to Wikipedia anyway, roughly to this. Observing the sounds or cries, I would say anguished cries of the world. And the Bodhisattva has vowed to attain Buddhahood for him or herself for the benefit of all other beings. The Bodhisattva, when she makes that vow, is not there yet. She is not yet a Buddha, although at the same time, in the weird Buddhist contradictory way, uh, Guan Yin is a manifestation of the Buddha of compassion, Avalokiteshvara, who's a man. Guan Yin, what do you think, looking at this? Uh, frequently depicted as a woman, frequently depicted as a man, frequently, I think in this instance, depicted as uh, either hermaphrodite or uh, sexless, I don't know, but gender seems to fade away. So I'm going to say she is my general pronoun, but think of it as S slash H-E. So she understands. I, I love, this is in an alcove, sort of a grotto, and Guan Yin is up on a pedestal. So when you come in, this is about how you see her. She's about life size, and you see her from about this angle. So it looks like this. Now, what is the expression on that face? Almost serenity? Neutrality? I want to see compassion there, but it's kind of hard to see it. And I think it's because a lot of what Guan Yin realizes as she observes and hears the cries of anguish is that that anguish can be alleviated if we can simply shed ourselves, rid ourselves of our delusions. Aaron has asked me to present a vision of a future in which we don't have a Mad Max all against all sort of Hobbesian existence. We don't have the Star Trek or singularitarian techno-magical fix to everything. Did anybody bring a dilithium, dilithium crystal? No? I believe such a thing is possible. What I think stands in our way, well, lots of things stands in our way. Sure, resource limitations on the horizon. Money limitations, credit limitations, uh, contracting credit in the short term, as Nicole has, has described. But really, I think the primary thing that stands between us and the sort of life that these gentlemen described earlier is our conditioned expectations. We expect that the future will be pretty much like the present, except maybe cell phones will be smaller and cheaper, and our cars might run on electricity part of the time, but otherwise it's going to be pretty much the same. But Guan Yin here she feels our pain, but she also understands that our desire to, as James Howard Kunstler likes to say, sustain the unsustainable is a recipe for misery and anguish. And I see no indication that we are going to veer from it anytime soon. And yet, at the same time, I have to try. And this is what Sally was talking about, holding the vision of the present, which includes a clear vision of our current trajectory, and a vision of where I'd like to be. And the distance between the two creates a tension and a creative resonance that causes a spark, causes a vibration, causes something that well, something that we can't predict and we can't plan. You know, Occupy Wall Street, we're all talking about Occupy Wall Street. We are trying to copy their General Assembly. And yet, nobody really sat down at a conference 
and said, okay, what we need to do is have this massively non-hierarchical, peer-to-peer, spontaneous assemblage of people who use technology in these specific ways in order to create a really effective protest which changes the terms of the discussion, the discussion which is controlled by the corporate media. If somebody had tried to detail a point-by-point -point outline of what's happening at Occupy Wall Street and all the other Occupy events, I do not believe that their plan would have succeeded. I think that it is the creative tension between what we are told, what we have been conditioned to believe, and what we really want to believe, because we have a lot invested in it, and what is becoming clear. What is becoming clear is a lot of what Nicole is talking about. The money, the credit, the attempt to fix every single problem in the world by creating more debt and throwing more fake money at the problem, more and more people are waking up to the fact that that is foolishness. And yet, the people who are winning that game and who have the most and who control the conversation in the corporate media, they have no intention whatsoever of giving up their advantage. And I think it will end in misery for them, and I hate, hate to say it, I'm very far from Guan Yin at this moment, but there is a part of me that relishes their fall, anticipates it. And while I've heard people who are uh, sort of putting forth a, a compassionate, holistic sort of message like Charles Eisenstein, who says, you know, the, we should be the 100%. We shouldn't be the 99% versus the 1%. Or I think more accurately, the 99.9% versus the 0.09% or 0.1%. I don't feel it. And sometimes I do thirst for vengeance and blood. And I want to let slip the dogs of war, as Shakespeare said. And I realize that's not a workable way to go. So what I'm trying to work my way around to here is that one, as much as I enjoy coming to con conventions, not conventions, but meetings, gatherings like this, and as much as I enjoy traveling around and meeting the people who listen to my podcast and who contact me, as much as I enjoy your company, I don't think that what we're doing here is actually what's going to give rise to something workable that we can transition into if we can shed ourselves in some cases quickly, in some cases slowly, in some cases kicking, dragging, and screaming, if we can rid ourselves of our conditioned expectations and belief systems and our narratives. Something Chris Martinson said at the, uh, the ASPO conference is that people don't really, for the most part, make their decisions based on information. They make their decisions based on the narratives and the belief systems that they hold and their own image of themselves and how they fit into that narrative. And I think the old narrative is breaking down. And if we can maintain the sort of dual vision of the Buddha and recognize that conditioned expectations give rise to misery, but that doesn't negate the misery. It doesn't on its own alleviate, or alleviate the misery, that there's going to be suffering. You know, I think we are headed for a better future, but I think it's going to be a rough transition. And I think a lot of people will suffer, but I think the most of that suffering will not be physical pain. It will not be hunger. It will not be cold. It will be, as Dmitry Orlov described, after the collapse in Russia, the middle-aged men who had been the movers and the shakers in society found themselves ripped from that narrative of who they are and how they succeed and what they contribute, and many of them drank themselves to death. I think that will probably happen here, although when I'm in my more bodhisattva state of mind, I hope that that can be minimized. So, what I'd really like to leave you with is mostly this image. This is a photograph, obviously. This is a photograph. This is a drawing, a sketch that was then later embellished with watercolor after the artist got home. And what she's written here is, Guan Yin Bodhisattva, um, Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, Kansas City, Missouri. She writes, I sat peacefully sketching this figure I have visited for half a century. So 
I've never met this artist, but she and I have stood right here. And me, through my cheating use of psychedelics, and her through probably her uh, more disciplined and consistent vision as the artist, experience something profound that I really can't articulate. I can stand up here and I can jabber and I can drop names and I can sort of recite other people's catchphrases about where we're going, but what I'd really like to do if I could is just look into each of your eyes and communicate the feeling that I have right now as I remember standing in front of that and I have that feeling again now. And this, I think, is for you, Aaron. I'm going to try to bring it back around to Daniel Quinn. The, the message that Daniel Quinn articulated and that I think Aaron wanted to use as sort of the, the basis, and this is what Tim will be talking about later, the basis for this gathering is not the idea that what's going to save us or what's going to deliver us to a better future is old minds running new programs, old minds enlightened by charismatic speakers, you know, with clever things to say. It's new minds running no program, no belief system, minimal expectations, just looking around, working with one another, finding out what works, and doing that. And that is all. <laughs>